Uh, next speaker is uh, Lakshmi from uh, IIT Bombay, and uh, she is going to talk about learning environments for fostering software engineering disciplinary practices in CS undergrads. So over to you, Lakshmi. Uh, you can start. Yeah, uh, thank you. So let me just do a quick uh, um, check. Am I audible? Is my screen visible? Yeah, everything is fine. So I think we can. Okay. Start. Yeah. One second. Yes. So um, thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I'm Lakshmi. Uh, I have my colleague and collaborator Prajish also here. So we'll be talking about uh, learning environments for fostering so disciplinary practices in CS undergraduates. So before I start, uh, I want to take you through uh, the department uh, that I come from, which is uh, the EdTech department. We are an interdisciplinary program. Uh, incidentally, last year uh, we completed our decade uh, of uh, uh, since we uh, started, and uh, we have two programs which are currently running: the PhD program and uh, the MTech program. So what do we do at uh, the EdTech department is uh, in terms of research, uh, we try to build uh, and create uh, uh, learning environments for students. Uh, we also uh, kind of model large scale uh, courses and uh, uh, you know, for teacher training as well as uh, student training. Uh, we develop tools uh, which support uh, learners as well as teachers in and also create MOOCs. Uh, for that, we engage with um, government, NGOs, as well as industry on very various sponsored projects and consultancy. And what do we do in terms of research is that one area, we have so many thrust areas. The first thrust area, as you can see, is uh, technology enhanced learning. So here we uh, work with disciplinary practices. Some of the example of disciplinary practices me and Prajish will talk about, but some more are like estimation, uh, troubleshooting, design, and we create learning environments for them, but they are rooted in the domain concept. So uh, let's say if it is uh, engineering estimation, it could be in electrical engineering, power, so they are integrated in domain concepts. Uh, we also work in teacher integration of edtech. Uh, we have various MOOC models and uh, various tools that we develop, so some of which you can see here on the screen. We also work the other thrust area, which is a very interesting thrust area, is uh, the uh, use of uh, uh, um, uh, tools, various tools that comes up like uh, emerging technologies like wearables and augmented reality and virtual reality. We kind of develop uh, applications on them and uh, see, uh, you know, more like case study where all could such emerging technologies be used. Uh, so one such you can see on the screen is we try to use a wearable for teaching learning of badminton. So uh, the other uh, thing that we also, other thrust area that we also are working now are uh, is educational data analytics, uh, use of wearable sensors, uh, as well as you know the learning environments that we develop. Uh, we kind of build in uh, logging systems to understand how learners learn, build the learner models, and so that you know we could uh, create uh, personalized learning environments for them. So uh, there are various uh, um, um, the wearable uh, analytics tools that kind of we use is the GSR, EEG, uh, eye tracker, emotion, uh, facial recognition, and also the learning environment tracking that we do. So this is uh, these are the thrust areas of our uh, department. And uh, one uh, other area that we are working is the computing education research. Uh, so um, this is a small group of uh, researchers that work in computing uh, discipline uh, in the sense like me and Prajish are uh, from the software engineering uh, discipline. So uh, uh, like uh, specific courses such as CS101, uh, algorithms, uh, networking. So uh, we have a, a couple of my colleagues also working at that. So given that, you know, I gave a small brief of where we are from. 
uh, I'm going to take you through uh, the, the title of the talk, which is uh, Fostering Disciplinary Practices. But before we uh, go and talk about, uh, you know, uh, what are we fostering and what is the learning environment about, uh, I want the audience to, uh, you know, maybe do some uh, uh, thinking exercise. Let's say uh, you're given, you, uh, you are all instructors and you're giving a, a problem to your uh, uh, students. This problem is create a conceptual design for a mood-based music player. Given that this is the problem, uh, the requirements are also given along with it. Let's say these are the requirements. You want the system to detect mood. It has to play automatically. It needs to recommend, keep track of the history, as also, also provide secure authentication. Now, when I say create a conceptual design, what do I mean uh, is uh, that, you know, it needs to have a description which is implementation independent, agnostic to the underlying learning and uh, uh, agnostic to the understand, underlying programming language or the paradigm, but it needs to support analysis. It needs to support exploration of design spaces. So this is what you want the learners to create. Now, given that this is you, what you'll be giving to our learners, I want you to think maybe, um, um, 60 seconds. You have provided one and a half hours to the to to solve this problem, and let's say a novice software designer or an undergraduate student is solving this problem. What would be their approach uh, to this problem? What do you think they will end up doing? So I might wait for uh, 60 seconds, and you could individually think. Maybe a little later down, we will use a chat window. True. Yeah, so I see some responses, but um, okay. Maybe you have thought, you have written down, I see some responses in the chat. But let's just take this question a little ahead. If you can compare and contrast with your own approach, considering you know we have experts here, we have faculty here, if you could compare and contrast the approach that the novice or your student would have taken, and if you can compare what you would do and think about it as well. So I would pause here for another 20 seconds. I think it's been 30 seconds that I paused. So now what I want uh, is, you know, you could unmute and talk or you could, you know, feel free to write it on the chat. Let's share some novice versus expert approaches. I'm going to, yeah. It's, I, I saw some uh, on the uh, screen. Yeah, you know, uh, novices would not sure what the novice approach would mean. Uh, it would mean like how would they solve this problem? Like I have uh, Alvin telling me that you know a novice would uh, think of how to detect mood. A novice would think of one functionality in depth is what for a ratio thing. So I'm writing it here. 
take me to visit the mood, play a song. Yeah, this, this is an interesting. Raghu said that there is an abstraction versus specificity would be the biggest difference. Raghu, if you could just unmute and see what do you think the novice would do and what do you think the expert would do? Um, so Lakshmi, I mean, uh, the, the fundamental difference is the amount of expertise that probably an expert has in such systems, right? So, so he's probably built such systems before. So in, in essence, you know, uh, see, he understands the domain, he understands uh, what sort of inputs go into the system, what is going to be the output for the system, uh, overall, what sort of data comes in and what sort of output needs to be, you know, or processing needs to be done for that particular data, et cetera, at a very high level. Whereas uh, novice is more or less, uh, I would assume the notion of novice here is, as I said, it's, it's a bit vague, but understand that he just knows about what's going to happen from a generic sense rather than a computing sense. So so he, he, he's thinking more about uh, end user perspective rather than the actual system itself. Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks for bringing uh, that uh, uh, point. So, yes, the novice thinks from an end user perspective, but the novice also, uh, let's say, you know, these days, uh, they also build uh, certain um, uh, small uh, uh, projects, or the novice, even though it comes from the end user perspective, if you call them to be CS undergraduates, they could start looking at it, uh, say, how would it be built? But uh, let me just, you know, these are some uh, um, interesting answers, but let me just also share with you some of the answers that uh, we got uh, when we were talking about this in 2019. So we got, so there were a bunch of features and instructors similar to uh, what we're seeing now. So these are uh, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, approaches that they shared and they kind of uh, spoke about. So, uh, um, yeah, given that, you know, see, they, like, some of them actually said that, you know, they asked for modes and, you know, uh, they would say, what are the different kinds of modes? Like, like Raghu also said, uh, the novices would come from more from an end user perspective. They would have used such systems and, you know, um, um, uh, other aspects that, you know, which were kind of, uh, um, not spoken about is that you know the experts would start doing failure handling. They would uh, talk about that, but the novices would be more in terms of you know only searching information for what kind of uh, uh, capabilities do I need to build? How do I build? So these are some of the pointers that we saw. But then why am I doing this? Is because you know to talk about something known as disciplinary practices. So disciplinary practices are actually processing skills that are used for sense making reasoning and problem solving. And these practices are used by experts as well as, you know, who are, uh, like we say, practicing designers as they design and analyze such models and systems. One of them, Raghu, just spoke about that they would use uh, their experience, similar systems that they have built and then kind of use them to build here. But what it is also says that research says that you need to teach such practices explicitly along with necessary content knowledge. So that is where we are coming from saying that, you know, disciplinary practices need to be taught. And in this talk, we are going to talk about two such disciplinary practices. One is integrated model building in software conceptual design, which I'll be talking about. And my uh, colleague and collaborator, Prajish, will talk about software design comprehension and how we have gone about and built learning environments for teaching and learning of these about disciplinary practices. So when I talk about integrated model building, uh, we use the framework of function behavior structure framework, and we have built the learning environment based on it. But let me just specifically touch upon in the first uh, uh, slide, what are the difficulties that novices have? So one of the difficulties that novices have, and I think Praji spoke about it, is that you know they work, they get fixated, they work on one functionality, and you know in depth try to see how that functionality can be um, uh, implemented, or make maybe they work on only one sub problem and see how it can be uh, solved, and they are unable, so they build pieces 
pieces of the solution, but they are unable to integrate uh, these pieces and form one solution. Why uh, is uh, because when we see uh, formal representations that are used uh, to describe these systems, one of them is UML. You see that you know uh, experts are able to integrate these representations on the fly. They're able to do it automatically, but uh, novices are not. They see them as isolated representation. Also, when I said approach, there are strategies like you know, like I said, in depth the novices go through. Uh, whereas uh, experts can, you know, go back and forth and can go across the functionality. And there are certain cognitive processes also that experts use, like, you know, like the uh, perspective, like uh, Raghu was talking about. You take, you become the system, you take the perspective of the system rather than just the perspective of the end user and switch between those perspectives. Uh, there is a, you, you simulate behaviors, you associate structures, um, and also abstract. So why did we then go for the function behavior structure design framework? Let me just quickly touch upon what it is. It's actually a framework. It's a visual structure that helps organize the information and ideas so that you can work on them more effectively. Like the FBS has uh, F, which is a function. So I have kind of written examples for the same mood-based music player uh, and also supports how these uh, elements transform into other aspects, other abstract aspects like behaviors and the logical components. How do these logical components interact with each other? So uh, the F is uh, the functionality. Uh, S refers to the logical components. And the behaviors are how does this functionality get implemented and how do the structures actually talk to each other to implement the behaviors. So this was proposed by Jero and Canon Seger, and it has been a universal design framework. It's used in mechanical engineering design, it's used in production engineering. Another aspect that we saw is that, you know, it's able to integrate the various uh, uh, perspectives of, you know, um, the end user, how does the system work, how do they interact with each other, and it also helps in grappling the abstraction problem. So given that we saw that this could be used, what did we go ahead is uh, we proposed the pedagogy of creating a FPS graph. So FPS graph looks like something so like this kind of a representation where you know they can uh, link uh, the functionality and the behavior uh, to the um, uh, structure. So this is how, and we want the learners to create something like this so that they can integrate uh, the various ideas that they come up with. So how do we, uh, I'm just going to take a quick demo of the learning environment that uh, I want to show here and pass it on to my um, uh, colleague. So we see that in the learning environment, uh, you know, we take them through various phases. So, yeah, so here you could see various phases. There is an agent here, and uh, you know, there are these graphs and the UML diagrams. There is uh, a that comes from the agent, and uh, you know, they can write notes. So this is the FPS graph. We let them to interact with the FPS graph, uh, um, not a static um, uh, representation. Uh, which can more like a dynamic representation, which can be manipulated. And uh, we get them to also evaluate with, based on various parameters. Uh, so we gradually take them through the levels of cognition of doing evaluation and synthesis, along with providing opportunities for reflection and planning uh, so that the, they also abstract the process in which they learn. So this uh, is uh, the learning environment that we created and uh, I will now pass it uh, to Prajish, uh, pass my mic to Prajish so that he can talk about um, the next one. Yeah, thank you Lakshmi. Yeah, so uh, Lakshmi uh, talked about, you know, integrated model building as one of the disciplinary practices. Uh, so now I'll be talking about uh, software design comprehension, uh, which is uh, uh, 
another skill which uh, is important in terms of uh, experts use it and students also find it difficult. So yeah, so what is software design comprehension? So if you uh, consider an example of an automated door locking system, so in the software development life cycle, you start with the requirements and from those requirements, those are translated into a uh, model such as uh, you create UML diagrams, which have different uh, uh, diagrams, which represent different abstractions of the system or different views of the system, right? So you have a class diagram, which represents the structure of the system, the, which are the different components, what are the individual functions of those components, and then you have uh, diagrams like the sequence diagram, which describe the behavior of the system. Right? And uh, what we see is that uh, uh, experts are able to uh, understand or develop an integrated understanding of these different uh, diagrams. And it is also an essential practice uh, uh, in the industry, right? So. Software developers, they usually start working on existing large complex systems and they have to write additional features based on new requirements and all of these tasks require them to explicitly comprehend a given software design. And uh, what we uh, see the uh, difficulties which novices face is that they are they do a superficial search on their design diagram. So we conducted uh, studies with students to understand how do they go about comprehending a given design. So one thing which we saw is that novices do not uh, uh, dig deep or they do not analyze the design diagrams in depth. So if uh, these diagrams are given to experts and we have anecdotal evidence from experts also, they do not consider these designs as static representations. They think about it uh, in terms of, you know, what uh, scenarios are happening in the system. You know, what will happen to this uh, part of the system if this scenario gets executed. So they are uh, simulating dynamic behaviors in the, the design. Uh, whereas novices, they have uh, difficulties in doing this uh, simulation of control flow and data flow within the design diagrams. Uh, so, uh, based on uh, these findings from our novice studies and studies with experts, uh, we came up with a pedagogy called uh, design tracing, and it uses a scenario centric approach of uh, uh, helping learners identify different scenarios and uh, simulating the control flow and data flow of these scenarios. So I'll not go into the depth of this model, but uh, later on, if we have questions, we can, uh, uh, I can explain this in depth. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the learning environment which we came up with is the very sim learning environment, which stands for verifying designs by simulating scenarios. Uh, it is a web-based learning environment. It is uh, available. Uh, it is available online. Anyone can go and uh, use the system. Yeah, the tech stack is we have used uh, front-end frameworks like Vue, and uh, the back-end is Node and MongoDB. So the activities in Verisim they train learners to simulate different scenarios using the design tracing strategy. So I'll explain what this is uh, in the next slide. So uh, what learners do is that, uh, yeah, I'll just give you a brief uh, demo. Yeah, so sure. this is the- uh, Prajish, can you yeah. kind of speed it up a little bit? Sure, sure, yeah. So this is an uh, interface of uh, Verisim. So here you can, So here you can see that uh, the learners are provided with uh, the UML diagrams and uh, uh, there is a representation like a state diagram which is given to learners. So what they do is the, the environment allows them to execute the state diagram and uh, 
is they are able to see corresponding changes in the sequence diagram and the class diagram. So uh, this sort of visualizations help learners develop an integrated understanding of these design diagrams. And uh, as you saw the state diagram, it actually simulates the control flow and data flow of a given uh, sequence diagram of, uh, of uh, the class and the sequence diagram. So after that, they solve some reflection and evaluation questions, uh, 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 which uh, so which helps them reflect on the tasks which they did, and uh, then they solve. So they solve similar challenges, which help them construct this uh, state diagram. Yeah, maybe we can move uh, to the next challenge. Yeah, so here you see that a state diagram is given which contains certain errors. Yeah, so uh, what learners have to do is uh, fix errors in the state diagram, and this state diagram simulates the provided scenario. So they uh, edit specific states and uh, they see what are, you know, what has to be changed. And uh, yeah, then the system gives them feedback. Now you see that you know the first state is correct, and so on. So uh, uh, to summarize, in in this uh, learning environment, learners build uh, or simulate the given scenarios of a given design, and we believe this helps them uh, develop an integrated understanding of different design diagrams and helps them in their software design comprehension. Yeah, Lakshmi, you can move on. Yeah, so uh, to summarize, uh, Lakshmi uh, described Think and Link and I talked about very sim. Uh, the key idea is we want to uh, help learners uh, do certain tasks and uh, reflect on them and help them monitor their own pro progress. And uh, the learning environment which you saw, they have features like question prompts, uh, visual representations. You are able to simulate the system behavior. There are agents which give you hints and feedback, and all of and tasks which uh, 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 promote reflection in learners. Yeah, so these are some key uh, learning environment features. Yeah, now I will hand it over to Lakshmi. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you wrap it up? Um, yes. Running yeah. out of these are the last. Yeah, these are the last two slides. Thank you, Raju. So, uh, we, this is not part of the talk, but we did uh, conduct uh, studies uh, with Think and Link and very Sim. Uh, you know, each of us conducted many studies, and they were both qualitative as well as quantitative studies in order to investigate the effectiveness. So, some of the sample RQs that we have used in these studies are that these studies effective. How do learners learn with these studies and how do they interact with these studies? Both are different questions. We looked at them as well. And when we see the results on a very top level, we see that they, are, they have improved in their use of disciplinary practices in the sense if you look at it as a continuum, they have moved towards the continuum, but you know, you can't really say they have reached the expert level. They have moved in towards the continuum, but what is more important is they have integrated these approaches in solving uh, ill structured problems, other ill structured problems. So, uh, yeah, so we throw open the floor for discussion in terms of what disciplinary practices are there in software design and development, how can they be taught in courses, and what difficulties do you foresee uh, teaching these disciplinary practices? Uh, this talk is based on a collaborative paper that in our group we have written, and you can find the paper here. So I will stop the screen okay. share. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lakshmi and Pratish. Uh, time for a quick couple of questions. Uh, anyone? Uh, okay, I guess I'll just get started. Maybe uh, hopefully people will ask. So, so um, the, the 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 notion of being able to simulate uh, your design and and uh, show how it works in a, in essence, you know, it's like saying UML in action, right? So, so fundamentally, the the area of 
executive diagrams you know has probably been there for more than 20 years right uh, when you when you start talking about executable uml and actually getting into uh, behavioral specification etc cetera, etc cetera. but it starts getting very very complex right and 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 at an abstract level what you're trying to do is for novice users right so so it's 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 more the more diagrams you have the more complex it gets okay so so the the idea of integrating all these diagrams in the first place in itself is actually going to complicate things uh, instead i would rather just have uh, one st structural uh, diagram one behavioral diagram and 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 stop right there and if i start getting into the 14 different diagram types then then people are going to get even more confused so so right. what do you think yeah yeah so uh, even our aim is not you know to help them integrate all these diagrams together but uh, the fundamental uh, uh, difficulty which we noticed in novices is that given a structural and a behavioral diagram you know they are not able to understand the relationship between these two diagrams and we are not uh, teaching them you know a procedural way to think about it but you know uh, the very notion of providing these visualizations to them to uh, and make them think in that direction that okay something happens in the sequence diagram uh, and what what will the changes be in the system you know so uh, such uh, uh, kinds of uh, thinking in students uh, th that is the aim of these uh, learning environments and uh, with regard to you know these tools are there uh, available right but uh, one thing is uh, they are used in the industry and uh, uh, there aren't scaffolds uh, or there aren't uh, uh, to uh, like these tools i feel cannot be directly used in classes so verisim and other learning environments are maybe one step towards making these tools use more usable in the classroom yeah that's what i feel okay uh, any other questions anyone uh, i have one question yes ragwan go ahead yeah so i was wondering whether the a uh, simulation tool uh, tells the learner what all paths they should follow in the simulation or is it the learner has to decide what all changes to make or does it guide them to follow specific workflows in changing those parameters and values yeah so, so can i take this yeah yeah lakshmi yeah. go ahead yeah yeah yeah, so thank you for this question. So uh, the prompts that you see from the agent are not problem specific, but the prompts that you see from the agent are very process specific. Let's say, for example, uh, you get the learner to see uh, if the learner has created certain function nodes, then you would say the prompts would see, okay, now you've created function nodes. Can you think of what are the associated structure nodes? What are the associated behavior nodes? So these come from uh, a more in terms of process uh, rather than actual problem-based prompts that getting them to solve the problem uh, are not the prompts. Yeah, Pratish, you want to also add? No, it's fine, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we will probably close the session. We're kind of running out of time, so maybe we'll take it offline. Uh, um, obviously, this is an area that is of interest, and I'm sure there's the others who are interested too uh we'll probably take a quick break uh, uh maybe uh, let me stop recording